Welcome to the next video, everybody. Today is going to be a spicy little introduction to Galois representations. So let's get to it. First of all, the most important object in mathematics, arguably, fight me. It's the Galois group of Q. It's the absolute Galois group of Q, uh, given the Carl topology. So for which a basis of neighborhoods is the, uh, of the identity is just the collection of normal subgroups H of finite index in the group. By translation, you know what the whole topology is. Okay. So this is a compact topological profinite group. Um, so one way of seeing this, for example, is that it's the inverse limit over Galois number fields F of Galois groups of F over Q with respect to the projective system of restriction maps on these, uh, uh, on these groups, okay? If you've never seen an inverse limit before, it's a construction from algebra. It's basically, so if I give you a, a system of groups GIs, the inverse limit of them with respect to what we call a system of projective, uh, projective system of maps is a subgroup of the product of all the groups that consists of all of the tuples with ith entry gi, such that gi is fij of gj whenever j is at least i. And what are these fijs? They're the, they're the, the projective system of maps, okay? So, so we have this, okay? So in our case, um, the FIJs are just the restriction maps on the Galois groups. So if I have, if I have one field sitting inside of another one, then there's a restriction map from the Galois group of the bigger number field to the Galois group of the smaller number field. And those are the FIJs, okay? And the ordering on the groups is of course by inclusion of fields. Okay, so, so there, that's, this is one way of seeing that you have a profinite group on your hands, all right? So what's a Galois representation? Well, a two-dimensional Galois representation over a topological ring A is just a continuous group homomorphism rho from the, the Galois group of Q to GL2 of A, two by two invertible matrices with entries in A. What kind of A's will we be looking at? We'll be looking at what are called coefficient rings. So here comes adjective soup. Um, a coefficient ring is a complete Noetherian local ring with finite residue field of characteristic P, which will be a fixed prime for us. Okay, so complete means kind of what you think it means. No theory and everybody knows no theory and local ring, it has a unique maximal ideal. Uh, what's the residue field of a, no, of a local ring? It's the ring mod its maximal ideal, right? So this is a field by abstract algebra class. That's called the residue field. We want that to be finite and we want it to be of characteristic P, let's say. Okay, now you can give A a topology. You can give it what's called the MA attic topology uh, where MA is the unique maximal ideal of A. What is that topology? Uh, a fundamental system of open neighborhoods of the identity there is just the set of powers of the maximal ideal. And so you can give this a topology, so you can give this a topology, and so continuous here, that makes sense. We can talk about continuity if we give this the Krull topology. Okay, you should think about what the MA attic topology is if A is a field. Okay, so <clears throat> I, we have a Galois representation, let's say, rho from GQ to GL2 of A for some coefficient ring A. Well, then MA be the maximal ideal of A and KA be the residue field. There's another representation you can produce out of the one I gave you called the residual representation of rho. It's a, represent, it's a Galois representation rho bar from GQ to GL2 of the residue field. And what do you do? You just compose rho with the natural entry wise mod MA reduction map here. So there's a map from GL2 of A to GL2 of KA. You just reduce all the entries in A mod MA, okay? That gives you a residual, what we call a residual representation, okay? Conversely, if I give you a row zero from GQ to GL2 of K for some finite field K, you can say that the given row is a lifting of row zero to A if K, first of all, is the residue field of A. And if the residual representation of your lift is the, re the representation row zero you started with, okay? And we'll say two liftings row and row prime of row zero to A are equivalent, we'll write row tilde row prime. If rho prime is just the conjugate of rho by some fixed matrix in GL2 of A, which is congruent to the identity mod MA. So when you reduce these liftings mod MA, the conjugation disappears basically because you just get the identity, okay? And so then a deformation of rho zero to A will be just an equivalence class of liftings under this equivalence up here of rho zero to A. And for a lifting rho of rho zero, we'll still often write rho for the corresponding deformation of rho zero, just kind of by an abusive language, okay? How about the determinant of a Galois representation? If rho is a two-dimensional Galois representation over A, then det rho from GQ to A cross is just the composition of rho from GQ to GL2 of A with the determinant homomorphism. Okay. So that's called det of rho, all right? How about local Galois groups? Uh, so let's let L be a prime and let's let Q sub L be the field of L-adic numbers, which is the completion of Q with respect to the L-adic value 
uh, I guess, bar Sabelle. So what is the L attic absolute value? Uh, well, first I'll tell you what the L attic valuation of, I'll just tell you um, kind of what this absolute value is on the rational numbers, which are dense here. So if I give you a rational number, R over S in lowest terms, uh, the L attic valuation of this means factor L out as many times as you can from the numerator and the denominator, leaving you with two numbers here that aren't divisible by L. This number here is the L attic valuation of this number. Okay, we call that VL of R over S. And then what is the L attic absolute value of R over S? It's just L to the negative valuation of R over S. So you can check this is an absolute value and you can check that up to equivalence. Uh, one, you have kind of one absolute value on Q for each L and then the usual absolute value, you know, from grade school and there are no other absolute values actually. Okay, if you wanna learn more about P attic numbers, look at uh, Govea's book. Right. Okay, anyway. So we have the L attic numbers. So let's fix the closure. This is not algebraically closed as a field. So let's take an, an algebraic closure of it, Q bar L. And we'll take an embedding of Q bar into Q bar L. If L is infinity, and according to evaluation theory, it does make sense to consider infinity as a prime. It corresponds to the usual absolute value, basically. Okay, you can see Neukirch chapter two for a great introduction to this. Or you can also see Clark's notes, P. Clark's notes, um, algebraic number theory two, I think they're called. Okay, so if L is infinity, I'm gonna set Q sub infinity to just be R. So basically like, if you allow L to be infinity, you've got a bunch of these fields QL. When L is a finite prime, these are just the fields of L attic numbers. When L is infinite, you just get the usual completion of Q with respect to the usual absolute value, but that's just R from analysis class, we know that, right? Okay, for each prime L, the local Galois group at L is just G sub Q sub L, and it's what you think it is, it's the absolute Galois group of Q sub L. So for example, if L is infinity, G sub Q sub infinity would just be Z mod two Z, right? Because it would just be the Galois group of C over R. So that's a group of order two generated by complex conjugation C. So I know from valuation theory that for each L, there's a unique absolute value on Q bar L extending the L attic absolute value on QL. Well, that tells me that uh, the elements of this local Galois group here are actually just the continuous automorphisms of Q bar L. So we actually get continuity by the uniqueness of this extension essentially, okay? Now, you have a fixed embedding Q bar and Q bar L, right? That means you can restrict elements of uh, Q bar L to obtain elements of uh, Q bar, duh, right? But Q bar is dense in Q bar L. And so it turns out that means, well, although this is just kind of clear, the induced restriction homomorphisms you get here by, by doing these restrictions from GQL to GQ are injected. Oh, that's fantastic. That means I can regard these as inclusions for each L. Well, that means that I can take, I can identify G sub Q sub L with its image here, which we usually call G sub L. Okay, these sub, so these G sub Q sub L is thought of as their images in G sub Q are called the decomposition groups of G sub Q. So you have one for each L, although not really. Look, everything we've defined so far depends on the choices of embeddings we made earlier. So these are not really well-defined objects, but it turns out they're kind of well-defined up to conjugacy. If you change embeddings, this just conjugates the corresponding decomposition group by an element of the absolute Galois group. And this is all talked about in Neukirch. Okay, so, so that's it for now. Uh, so starting next time, we'll begin looking at some examples of Galois representations. So, and we'll start by looking at the cyclotomic character. So I'll see you then and thanks for watching.